We're back at this Channel 9 stage here at TechEd in New Orleans, New Orleans, New uh, Orleans, 2013. Fantastic. And I am blessed with another Commonwealth individual. I had Ben Armstrong earlier today. For those of you that were alive on the stream earlier on, you're trying to figure out what kind of accent he had. He has a Northern Australian accent to the west side uh, in Brisbane. Not Brisbane, as I was corrected, it's Brisbane. And uh, where do you hail from, my friend? Uh, I hail from uh, a little place called Phillip Island, actually. Uh, Phillip which is, Island? Yes, which is in Victoria, which is down sort of the south uh, east. And uh, that's where they do the Grand Prix. So the Formula ah, One Grand Prix, uh, nice. if anyone knows about that. And so who, who are you, by the way? Me, I'm, uh, <laughs> mate, everyone calls me Macca. My name's Andrew McMurray, but being an Australian, we can't possibly uh, use our own names. We all have nicknames, so okay. I'm Macca, and I'm an IT Pro Evangelist and I look after Windows infrastructure. So specifically, uh, helping our, uh, our customers understand why they should deploy Windows and System Center and Windows Server. Nice, now I asked you on the stage, purely for self-promotion because we are both doing a day-long track, as it were, here at TechEd, specifically oh, yeah. on upgrading. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about Server 2012 upgrades and how to get there from different versions uh, to the optimal state. And those are not going to be broadcast here at Taste of Tech Ed, but they will be broadcast on demand after the fact. So uh, stay tuned if you are interested about that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be opening up the floor for questions right now to go for anything that you might have with regards to upgrading your infrastructure. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I've got to ask you, this is a pretty simple kind of generic blanket question. Are you an in-place man? Or are you an upgrade man? Oh, sorry, a, a migration man. Well, in-place or migration? Where, do you, where, where does your hat fall? Well, personally, I've always been a migration man. Always been a migration man. I'm, I'm scared of in-place upgrades. Yeah. If something goes wrong, you're in a whole world of hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I sort of move forward into this current age, I'm starting to you know, potentially change that because you know so much virtualization out there now. Yeah. The ability for us to uh, effectively be able to roll back to where we were if something goes wrong means that doing an upgrade now becomes you know really much more of a possibility. Okay. I I also fall under the migration side of things as well as opposed to an in-place. But I was recently having a discussion with the file server team, and uh, I was having an argument, not really an argument, I would say a discussion uh, with Jose Beretta uh, about uh, file servers and what you should be doing to them, in-place upgrades or doing a migration of stuff. And he was saying, you know, it really comes down to your comfort level. Mm. The in-place upgrade is actually the most tested scenario out there during our break-fix tests uh, of uh, OS deployments, this sort of stuff. Uh, and so, potentially, you might be a candidate to be able to be used as a in-place upgrade. So, oh, absolutely, we'll actually be uh, debating this at different stages, at different points. I think too, if you're looking at uh, you know, physical servers and potentially uh, upgrading physical servers, why not look at actually doing a physical to virtual migration oh, and yeah. then doing a, uh, an in-place upgrade there? That way, at least you've got a rollback capability fairly easy. That's true. And, and normally, again, if you're looking at doing a, a migration, it's also the great opportunity to get rid of that old hardware that's oh, end yeah. of life. You know, We all had those servers in the back that basically you always were nervous whenever the cleaning staff went close to them inside the <laughs> server room or you know, if you had to do a reboot on them, you're terrified for security patches because you never knew if the damn thing would come back up again. Absolutely. <laughs> and that, that, the old anecdote of you know the cleaner unplugged the server yeah. in order to put the vacuum cleaner I mean, that, that actually happened at a place I worked at. And this was a long time ago. I worked at a medical research institute and our main servers were sitting in a, a cupboard and literally they would get unplugged every night in yep. order to do the vacuuming. Pretty oh, scary wow. stuff. Not, not, and you wonder why you had those, uh, what was it, 8009 uh, event log entries or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's it. It was there. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So if you're on the Channel Line site right now watching, so I'm hoping someone's out there watching, if you have any questions about Windows Server infrastructure upgrades, uh, by all means, fill out the form, hit submit, and someone will be able to promote them so I can see them on the screen as I look over at my producer Sounds pretty to, good. Uh, to look at any questions that might have come up or anything like that. So we will have you covered when they come up. Now, you and I have been, uh, have been co uh, cooperatively developing this content for the upgrade stuff. What would you say would be the most interesting scenario that you believe will be answered based on feedback from your customers and people you've talked with that they're the most interested in? Oh, definitely uh, virtual domain controllers, uh, the thing that I get asked about a lot. And I think one of the most exciting aspects of that is the, uh, the capability for us to do DC cloning now in a way, uh, especially through uh, VM Gen ID, in a way that's absolutely safe. Right. Uh, the old USN bubble problem uh, that we used to have with, uh, with domain controllers is now gone when you're dealing with a, a hypervisor that's uh, VM Gen aware. 
and being able now to clone DCs gives me the ability to uh, push out large numbers of DCs in a very fast uh, space of time simply by cloning an original domain controller. Right. And I've seen a lot of excitement about that, uh, especially down in Australia where we um, where we you know, traditionally wanted to go down the path of virtualization for domain controllers. A lot of our major customers have wanted to do that, but of course haven't been able to because of those issues with USN bubbles. Now, you don't think that there's a, a level of apprehension with having to switch? I mean, we've been uh, preaching the fact that you should not be virtualizing your domain controllers for the longest time, and then we brought in that capability to now do it. People are still not hesitant, or are they like jumping in with not, both feet, dude? Not that I've seen. I've seen a, a, quite a, an interest in jumping in at that because we're, oh, yeah. we're now at a point where we can specifically state that we support you know, that virtualized domain controller, that cloned domain controller because of the VM Gen ID thing, mm -hmm. and I think that people are prepared to take that step now. And I can see our very first question is up on the board from Ed, and it's actually talking about a cluster environment, which is always fun when we start talking about upgrading clusters. Can I upgrade on a 2008R2 Hyper-V cluster to 2012? If not, can I break the cluster, upgrade one node to 2012, migrate the VMs, and then upgrade to the second host? Very long, drawn-out question. Mm, well, we have a, uh, a number of um, uh, videos around that uh, exact topic, if I remember correctly, on yep. uh, migrating a, a 2008R2 cluster uh, to 2012, I think that was done on the Edge Show recently. Yeah. I was about to say my colleague Simon Perriman actually did a recent episode on the Edge Show talking about it, and uh, a little anecdote of history. He was actually on the cluster team, and that was one of the things that he was managing during the initial phases of 2002 uh, and 2012 development before he came over to the, to the uh, evangelism side, mm. uh, specifically talking about it. So it is a wizard-based process you have to go through. Absolutely. Uh, it is not a, um, I'm going to say, it's not as easy as popping the disk in and saying click, 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 next, 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 done. No. There is more to it, uh, but it does give you reports before and after, tells you how to do it, and it will actually go through that process. But uh, there will be some negotiated um, downtime to yes. be able to do that migration. It's, it's not as seamless. Now, with 2012, R2, oh, we actually, all, guess, yours, I, all yours, I man. insist, I he, insist he, going he, in. you're, All right, well, in 2012 R2, one of the exciting things will be that we will actually give you the ability to live migrate uh, the VMs from a, uh, a 2012 uh, RTM uh, Hyper-V cluster through to a, a 2012 R2 Hyper-V cluster. Right. So that will be very exciting. And I will, I will give one caveat to that though. It is a one-way migration. Oh yeah. It's uh, like the Roach Motel. You can go in, but once you're there, you're there. <laughs> you can't get back out <laughs> Absolutely. again. Absolutely. So <laughs> you're there. Uh, let me take a look. Uh, we have one here from Glenn Berry. What are some of the top reasons to upgrade from 2012 uh, to Windows Server 2012 R2 from a performance and scalability perspective. Now, I've been chained to my desk at the Channel 9 stage for the last couple of days. It's a nice way of saying that I'm working. Uh, <laughs> you've been able to, you know, take in some of those sessions. Uh, and did you, did you see any specific ones in 2012 R2 that we, you would think would be um, a big push to say, go ahead and accelerate that move. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, probably the most exciting thing that I've seen so far from the performance uh, side of the fence is in our ability now through storage spaces to do storage tiering oh, in, uh, yes. in server 2012 R2. So yeah. the idea is that we can create a, uh, a storage space using a mixture of, uh, of spindle-based disks and SSD-based disks yeah. and effectively uh, tier those within the virtual disk so that any hot data gets moved to the, uh, the SSDs while colder data stays on the, uh, uh, the spindle-based disk. So that is an incredible performance yeah. uh, improvement. And, and uh, quite literally, we saw the demo of that on the keynote, if you wanted to take a look at that. I think they also showed it again in a bit more detail in the foundation session for transforming your data center. And uh, Jose has actually got a whole session on that and more. That's there. And it literally is as simple as with, this, with the server manager interface, going ahead and selecting the drives, and then it detects that there are different performance, because there's actually metadata property about the drive for the type of drive it is, uh, for how yes, fast absolutely. it is. And basically, when it, when it detects that it's an SSD, it will automatically carve that up and give you the option, the wizard. If it detects they're all the same, then it just leaves it alone and it assumes you make it a simple space. It's, it's actually stupidly simple to the point where <laughs> it, it is so easy to do that you look at it and think this can't possibly work because it is yeah. so easy to do. Those of us that have been working in enterprise class storage for a while uh, are probably uh, familiar with the, the amount of work you actually have to do with a, uh, with a device to, to get that ready. And, um, yeah. Yeah, this stuff is just phenomenal. Um, probably the, uh, the other thing that I was really interested to see, and 
it's kind of from a performance point as well, is the ability for us now to, on a per VM basis, to uh, limit the amount of IOPS that we give to an individual uh, VM storage, which can be really good in a uh, hosted provider scenario, oh, okay. where you have uh, a bunch of VMs uh, at a hoster, perhaps you're going to be running a, uh, a high scale uh, database workload on one of those, and of course the IOPS go through the roof and it starts affecting the rest of that uh, service provider's customer's VM estate. Uh, we can now say on a per VM basis, well, let's just limit the amount of IOPS we give to that machine. So granted that uh, uh, workload is going to take a little longer to finish, yeah. but you're not killing all the other customers and that I, are sharing that space. And I believe it's actually a two-way street. It's not just mm. a limit, so the maximum, but it's actually uh, maintain a minimum and also allow up to a maximum. So it does both ways. Correct. So you can guarantee the availability as well as preventing the noisy neighbor syndrome that happens to be there. My, mine, uh, I think, would have been along the lines of um, some of the cool stuff that we're doing on the, just in the hypervisor space. Yep. Uh, I know that uh, one thing I didn't think it was a big deal, but actually makes a lot of sense, is um, the ability to have console access without network access to the VM if you need to, oh, for yeah. troubleshooting purposes uh, in a hosting environment. And also the ability to do um, VM activation. Yes. So basically you activate the data center license on the host system and then it is able to go in and act as an activation process for all of the guests, where it does not need to go off and talk to somebody else. That hugely simplifies uh, large environments to running KMS servers. Oh yeah, and absolutely also from the hosting perspective, can, that VM activation is can, a massive benefit. Can you tell that we're a bunch of virtualization geeks up here or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, take a look at this. Uh, PS user is asking us over here, with virtual DCs now supported, with 2012 and also R2, uh, do you still recommend a portion of the DCs to be physical, or is it within practice to use all virtual domain controllers? What's your thought on this? Because this is more of a, of a guidance thing from a consulting side of thing. What would you say? Are you old school? I, uh, I would say that given the capabilities we now have with VM Gen ID and the fact that we don't have to worry too much about rollback issues, uh, there is no reason why you couldn't go a completely VM DC estate, yep. in my opinion. Uh, I don't believe that it will happen immediately. I think that there'll still be plenty of customers out there that will want that feel-good security oh, thing yeah, of at least one physical DC. But in terms of you know, purely a supportable uh, uh, question, we could go all VMs. Oh, absolutely. I would say wholeheartedly jump in both feet, go yeah, all definitely. virtually. Provided you ensure you have an external time source you're talking to. That's the biggest thing, right? Yep, definitely. That you don't have any time drift that's going on. Make sure you have an, an external time source that your primary domain controller, FISMO role owner, yep. is pointing to reliable time external source. External NTP that, that, That's the most important. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, there are customers out there that still have schema review boards in place for any kind of schema changes, so they're probably going to be a bit more uh, risk adverse, if you will. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that are out there for going that whole virtualized DCs. Uh, virtualized DCs are manually built, virtual DC supported, thus avoiding the cloning issues mentioned. Tim Carson's question. Do you understand that one, what he's talking about there? Uh, I'm not quite aware of the cloning oh, issues. Oh, wait, wait. I... Are manually built, virtual domain controllers supported? Well, yes, they so, are. Without cloning. So absolutely, yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, Hand build a virtual DC, you're yeah, all in, no you're, problem. You, our demo environments, we create them from scratch. Oh, yeah. They're from out of the box, a domain control that's virtualized. Yeah, in uh, our demo environment, we have three manually built virtual yeah. DCs, and we're going to do some cloning no, ones as No well. physicals anywhere. No. Uh, again, once again, make sure that you are doing this in the production environment, that you have an external time source exactly. uh, that you can be pointing to. Uh, there we go. How about uh, an, an M? is asking a question here, Mr. Khan, what should be the roadmap for customers still running Windows Server 2003? The first thing we have to say is the support features of 2003 and a supportability statement is that it is very near end of life. I believe it is 2003-2014, sorry, uh, 2000, it's April 2014, 2015? Okay, I'm getting the note over there from the producer for the, <laughs> the proper ones. Anyway. It's coming fast, how about that? <laughs> it's, it's already in extended support mode, as yeah. it is. Uh, so you're gonna wanna basically start to, to do the moves off of that as soon as possible. Uh, and there is specific guidance that uh, we'll be talking about in our sessions. Yeah, absolutely. Both if you are currently on 2003, or if you're in 2008 for different pieces of your infrastructure, how you'd move the different pieces over. Mm. The biggest issue with 2003 environment is? Uh, See, I'm testing you right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's the biggest issue if you're on 2003 environment right now for the operating system that's preventing you from going to the next level? 
I'm completely blanking you. Yeah, you've blanked me out. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I got you. X86, baby. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. 64-bit. Yep. Big issue. Absolutely Big right. issue. And not to mention the fact, like I always like to say in my sessions, if you had a dog when 2003 came out, it would be dead by now. I still have my head More in my likely. DC clouds there. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, the uh, x86 issue, there's no direct upgrade path mm. uh, for being able to do in-place upgrades, so you have to do a migration. Yep, and absolutely. And there's guided documentation about how to get from 2003 x86 over to the x64 platform for all the different components and we'll make sure we address that in our session yep. from uh, the which we'll be able to catch online. And from the uh, domain controller perspective, you know, if you've got uh, 2003 domain controllers still out there that are holding the FISMO roles, make sure you get those uh, transferred. Yeah. Make sure that all of your replication is finished and that we're completely aware of the fact that those FISMOs are off 2003 before we start uh, demoting right. any of those old uh, 2003 domain controllers. That's a big thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good point. Good point. Uh, it does take a little bit of time for your application to converge. It certainly does. Especially in large, large environments. Uh, oh, look at this, Carlos. Good question here from Carlos. I'm from the school of thought that the best solution is a clean state install in place of upgrades. They scare me because they carry forward the hidden malware, corrupt files, and other stuff like that. How do you address these issues with in-place upgrades? Well, I think the first thing you want to do is make sure there's no malware on the machine. And you should really be doing that with an enterprise class anti-malware solution. So hopefully you've done that uh, before you attempt to do, to do anything of that, that sort. Um, yeah, I can understand why you would be worried about uh, carrying forward corrupt files and so on and so forth. And I think that... And, and, and you know, just to be clear, I'm also of that kind of thought, and you're also just now starting to move out of that kind of thought as well for, for upgrade process, mm, right? Mm. Yeah, look, I think that um, a, a clean slate install absolutely will be fine, a migration path will be fine, but if you're looking at a, an in-place upgrade, you know, definitely consider the idea of uh, physical to virtual migrating the box into a virtual world before you start doing anything, and that way you've at least got the ability to roll it back very easily if something goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you certainly... Um, would, um, would be very well uh, served to be doing a lot of uh, scanning of those files, so maybe doing some check disk activity and stuff like that before you go ahead. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I would not necessarily be totally scared of the in-place upgrade uh, scenario anymore. Uh, for instance, one of the things that uh, we do in, in one of our sessions this week, well, we don't actually do it because it takes too long, but we do an in-place upgrade of one of our uh, domain controllers from 2008 R2 through to uh, Windows Server 2012. We, we're not going to do it live because the process takes you know, upwards of half an hour. And nobody Unless you want there. to watch a progress bar for well, 20 well, minutes, I love right? a progress it's... bar personally, man. <laughs> I think it's fantastic, but not everybody else does. So uh, we're going we're gonna to video that and sort of play it fast back. And spoiler alert there, sorry, everybody. Um, and it, it works just fine. Yeah. You know, and, and in the past, that would have been something that I would be deathly afraid of. But uh, just, you know, definitely make sure that, that the machine is clean before you go ahead and do anything. Consider a virtual, uh, physical to virtual migration before you go ahead, and you should be okay. I mean, I definitely would say this, this speaks to the whole process of the level of maturity and the development of the ways that we've been developing software for a long time. Mm. Things have gotten a lot better. And, and you know, I, I am also from the old school way of doing things. And, it's, you know, habits are a hard thing to break. Well, and yeah. I'm used to doing migrations as opposed to in places. But I've been warming up to the idea of, of uh, migrations more. Uh, sorry, of in place more, especially with the whole ability to go off and to go from physical to virtual first and have a, a backup plan if you need to. For me, for me, it's a, a CY, CYB, cover your butt. Yeah, right. And I think it's a, a really, it, it's an interesting type scenario too that you'll see a lot of, for want of a better term, uh, younger people in the industry that have been in the industry for not as long as we have, that have um, been working with, with software that's a long way down the development track where it is a lot safer to do this sort yeah. of stuff these days. Now you and I, you know, we may have done uh, upgrades in the past, let's say in the you know, NT351, NT4 days, it didn't go so well. And once you burn once, you don't tend to want to put your hand back in the fire. So right. it is very, very hard to break that, that habit. But no, I yeah. agree. I think we're, we're getting there. I got a question from an unknown guy talking about virtualized domain <laughs> controllers and a failover cluster. Uh, is live migration supported? Greets. Nice to see you, unknown guy. Um, I'll take that one there. Okay. It's, it's, it's the, the role of a domain controller is not designed to be a clustered supported role. Um, basically, you just simply run with the architecture of how domain controllers work. You simply have a second domain controller inside the same sites, 
definition of a site is subnet and well-connected network, uh, or inside other sites to be able to handle your failover. Uh, sorry, to be able to handle in case that main domain controller is not available. So uh, it's got its own level of resiliency built into it. Uh, so again, if it is now a virtualized domain controller, you have no restrictions whatsoever for where it happens to sit, what hardware it sits on, and the ability to have complete and total live migration or shared nothing migration, mm -hmm. or storage migration of any kind. So basically three different types of migration is supported with that domain controller. With basically within the span of a TCP window, which means it's a live migration, it'll continue to go off and answer questions. Absolutely. And again, technically, if that one box was down uh, for any point in time, a client is going to be smart enough that it's going to be able to go off and find DNS Where's my domain controller? Go and talk to this guy here. He's inside my same site. Go off and ask him for a, for a, for a authentication process. Yep. He's going to not answer, and I'm going to go back to my DNS and say, where's the next guy? It's the closest one to be able to go to. So mm. the nature of how the Active Directory system is architected already handles that side of thing. SBS Ooh. 2011. Oh, Wait, you're walking away from that oh, one? Matt, already. talk about it? <laughs> so uh, this is, this is a, a type of question that we get asked, I get asked a lot from a lot of different people. And, and my, my answer always is along the same lines of it depends with how you're going to be approaching this. Because there's never a single answer for how to uh, migrate from one particular in integrated solution like SBS 2011, 2010, 2007, whatever version it happens to be, over to something else. Mm. Uh, what I will say is that obviously uh, with the SBS environment, with a lot of the migration stuff that I've seen in the past, They've been swing migrations or they've been some kind of, you know, bring up a parallel environment and then do a data migration over because you're dealing with smaller numbers uh, and that side of thing, right? Mm. So um, generally speaking, you are going to want to look at being able to move from 2011. That's the current version for 2011 Essentials. Uh, that's what it's called. Or sorry, 2012 Essentials. Mm -hmm. uh, over to uh, the next version, whatever the next version happens to be. Uh, and then uh, get the functionality you're looking for to be able to do that migration. But there's nothing as far as an easy scenario to talk about. It's always a let's let's work on this kind of thing. Mm. Hey, we got another Canadian asking a question there. Steve yeah. from Halifax. Hey, how's it going, eh? Maybe you already covered, <laughs> but what about Hyper-V 2000 R2 to 2012 R2 upgrades, non-cluster configuration, is shutting down all the VMs, upgrading the R1 server to the best approach or straightforward when it's released, of course. So basically going from an older version of Hyper-V to a new version of Hyper-V. Uh, non-cluster environment. I don't think we have any guidance on the R2 question right now. No, the, the it's a R2 little bit too early, early for that. Yeah, so but mm. to 2012. Yes. Um, simple matter of you're able to go in and to do an export import yep. uh, of the machine very easily. There is no live migration between them. You That's have to right. do an export import. Uh, and then automate, you're going to want to be able to go in and uplate, update the uh, integration components yes. uh, on that box. And the integration components Once you're important. at 2012, there will be the ability to migrate stuff from 2012 to 2012 R2. Correct. And you'll be able to test that during the release preview that's going to be coming out later in June. Mm -hmm. you, read, you guys like typing in very long questions yeah. for us to be able to try to scan <laughs> them quickly. Uh, it's coming here. Uh, with all domain controllers virtual, but live migration only being possible with Hyper-V hosts that are members of the same domain, unless it's changed, uh, wouldn't this still require a physical DC in the case of bringing up at least one of the first physical boxes first, or is live migration possible between standalone servers? Well, I can answer that part easily yep, enough. Second live migration, uh, share nothing live migration, or storage migration, all the migration aspects of anything to do with Hyper-V all require that they are part of the same security principles domain, which Correct. is the Active Directory domain. Uh, to be able to do it. It's not possible to do a live migration between member servers. Hmm. And it has never once come up in any of my discussions with the product team that that has changed with the next version that we haven't fully disclosed or fully talked about anything just yet. Hmm. So um, that's the easy question to answer right there. Will you cover how to move a certificate authority to a newer OS in our session? Afraid not. That is uh, a great question. Uh, thank you very much, Martina. That is definitely a good one for a webcast, I think. Well, it's a good one for a webcast. I actually covered that from a previous version, 2003 to 2008 R2 process. And it is a matter of exporting the certificates, the templates that are being used and everything else like that, bringing them into the new one and then having the names, the uh, property assigned, stuff like that. All that still applies. Uh, there is nothing new added to the migration process if you're migrating a certificate CA. Uh, we, because of time constraints, we're not including that in our sessions this week. Mm. But um, hey, if that's of interest, leave us a comment, let us know mm, for sure. uh, during the individual sessions, and we will ensure that we can put up a webcast on that just to see if it's changed at all. Yep. 
Uh, another question, can you move from a 2012 standard install to a 2012 data center install by changing the license? Now, unless I'm very much mistaken, I have done that by changing product key. Um, but I, I'm, I, I can't remember I, exactly. I, I, I will say that this is strictly a licensing issue mm. because there is absolutely no technical differences as far as capabilities between Correct. a standard and a data center with 2012. Yep. In 2008 or two, we had differences between enterprise and standard and that sort of stuff with what you could do with cluster and that sort of thing. With 2012, it is the same uh, capabilities on both of those systems. And it's interesting you say that. You know, Just, just one of the, the most fundamental uh, ways in which you can really uh, get to grips with the fact that the, the feature sets don't change between standard and, and data center is the fact that we don't differentiate between uh, the two types of server from the logon screen anymore. That's now, true. when you get a logon screen on server 2012, it just says Windows Server 2012 underneath. Whereas if you were in uh, 2008 R2, it actually specified the SKU of server that you were running. Now, it's yep. just little little nuances like that that, uh, that we've put into 2012. But yeah, licensing question, probably best for the licensing nice. guys. Eh? We have about two minutes left in case any last minute questions come in. I'm not going to ask you something completely off the wall. You're on Bourbon Street for the first time a couple nights oh, ago, my, my friend. Mate. <laughs> Yeah. I have photographic evidence of the fact that he was on Bourbon Street. Yeah, can um, we not put that up on uh, no, Twitter or anywhere? It's, 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 like, it's like Las Vegas. It yeah. just stays here, it happens here. Excellent. What do you, you think of it, man? Coming from Australia, first time in Nolens. Is, is there anything comparable down under? Yeah, it's kind of like the Gold Coast. Speaking of the Gold Coast, <laughs> if you want to come to Tech in Australia this year, <laughs> basically we, you're, just, you're just shifting Bourbon Street halfway across the world. That, that's really what, it, what it's about. When, uh, except when, we don't have those things. You don't have the, the beads. The beads. We don't have the beads down there. We've got something else entirely. Okay. Uh, yep. uh, so what are the dates of Tech Out Australia? Uh, dates of Tech Out Australia are the 2nd to the 6th of September, I do believe. And the call for content just recently closed. You're going to be doing a draw? For no, it didn't. it didn't. No, close? it is still open until the... Uh, oh, it's New Zealand that closed. It's New Zealand that's closed. Oh, We're okay. still open. We're open until I think it's the 15th of, uh, of June. Yeah. So get your sessions in. Those of you watching from Australia, get your sessions in. We have lots and lots of submissions. Oh, nice. Really keen to see you know, your, 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 yeah. your best stuff out there, your, uh, your deployment sessions, anything you want, put it through. Well, you know, I happen to know a guy that might be able to accept our upgrade sessions to possibly go in down there. So I'll put a shameless plug in to say, hey, if you want to have upgrade, I'm your man, I can help out. All right, I'll, I'll get on the side tonight I'll, and approve them, mate. Not I'll, a problem. I'll see if I make the cut and the <laughs> review process. Uh, with that, I think, you know what? Are we getting close to wrapping up? I think I got about 30 odd seconds left before we hand it off back to Taste of Tech Ed. Now, they're, actually, we're coming back into um, uh, hacker, hacker tools you should be looking at. So, very interesting session coming up right cool. after this. It's going to be streamed live. Don't forget, uh, all the sessions you're looking at right now at TechEd are available on demand within 24 to 48 hours of their completion. You're welcome to go off, take a look at the catalog, and uh, pre-select the ones you want to go off, take a look at. Thanks a lot, Maka. You come Thank along. Thank you, mate. Right? I appreciate it. Great for to be here, and I'm way. almost over the jet lag. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs>